In the year 1180, a French poet by the name of Christian de Troyes, that is Christian of Troyes, wrote an epic poem entitled Percival le Conte du Graal, Percival and the Legend of the Grail. But de Troyes did not finish this poem, and this invited a number of other authors to take his work and run with it, with the result that there arose no fewer than a dozen legends of the Holy Grail in French, German, Latin, Welsh, and Anglo-Saxon. Now, none of these legends was ever put forward as serious history. No, they were much more like what we would call historical novels or historical science fiction. Fictional stories placed in historical settings using historical figures and based on historical events. The problem with the Grail stories and the Arthurian legends is that they were so numerous and so popular, so widely read and so fancifully written, filled with imaginative characters, supernatural events, acts of heroism and feats of daring do. And they captured the popular imagination to such a degree that in the minds of many, they became inseparably intertwined with actual history, leaving many at a loss to discern fact from fiction. And that's a shame, because the actual history is not only fascinating, but it's informative to us as students of the Bible. We'll be talking more about the actual history a little next week, but today we're looking at the legend. Now, as I said, there are many legends, but the, the mytheme, the kernel that runs through all of these legends is something like this. It starts with fact. When Christ and his apostles left the upper room to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, the women traveling with them, who had cleaned up after the Last Supper and had packed up all their supplies, went as well. Then the next day, the Lord died on the cross. As we read in Matthew 25, 57 through 61, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a large stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Now, according to John 19.39, Joseph did not do this alone. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, who bought the spices needed to bury him, and who helped him take Jesus down from the cross, prepare and wrap his body, and lay him in the tomb. And according to Luke 23.55, the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. But according to the legend, the women did more than just follow and watch. They helped Josephus and Nicodemus prepare the Lord for burial. And as they were taking him down from the cross, blood was still flowing from his wounds. Joseph asked for a vessel to use to capture the blood. And Mary Magdalene handed him a chalice from which the Lord had drank the Last Supper. And therein fell the blood and sweat of Christ. Now, according to church history, later on, after the resurrection, after the day of Pentecost, in the early years of the church, Joseph of Arimathea was sent out by Peter, James, and John as a missionary. And he went to Syria to preach the gospel. There he was arrested and jailed for some time, but was eventually released and is known to have established several churches in Syria, out of which came the Syriac Orthodox tradition. However, according to the legend, 
While Joseph was in jail, his jailers tried to starve him to death. But the chalice of Christ, which Joseph still had in his possession, had regenerative powers, and it sustained him, providing him with life energy he needed to live without food. Then, back to history again, after his release from jail, he traveled westward through Egypt and across North Africa, eventually making his way to the British Isles, where he continued to preach the Gospels. Tertullian, the second century historian, wrote in Adversus Judeos that Britain had already received and accepted the Gospel in his lifetime, writing all the limits of the Spains and the diverse nations of the Gauls and the haunts of the Britons, though inaccessible to the Romans, have been subjugated to Christ. And Eusebius and Hilary of Poitiers confirm the same. As the story goes, Joseph of Arimathea evangelized the British Isles and most notably established a church at Glastonbury where he is buried having died at the age of 86 after serving the Lord among the Celts for 44 years. If you go to Glastonbury today, you can see what is purported to be his grave, marked with his epitaph. However, now back to the legend. Before he died, he entrusted the chalice to his fellow churchmen who built the castle Corbeni to house it and keep it under guard. Then, centuries later, a descendant of Joseph of Arimathea, Percival, who was one of the knights of the round table of King Arthur, famously encountered the Fisher King, whose loins and land were under a curse and were barren. Thus, the knights, recalling the regenerative powers of the chalice, set out on a quest to find it, for the castle Corbeni had fallen into ruins. The chalice, of course, is the Holy Grail. The word grail being traced back to the low Latin graal by researcher Charles Williams as the word used for the cup of the Eucharist in the earliest Latin rites, while the name of the castle, of the castle in which it is housed, Corbeni, finds its origins in Arabic, kurban, which is the word used in both Syriac and Coptic churches to refer to the Eucharist. Thus, the legend comes full circle. Now, I didn't come here this morning to spin a yarn. It's not my mission to persuade you of the legend of King Arthur and the Round Table, or of the quest of Percival, Lancelot, and Galahad to find the Holy Grail. The people who generated that legend didn't believe it. And I don't, I don't think they ever intended that those who read their books would believe that they were factually true. That's why the works are entitled Legend. (laughs) They were just telling tales. And, as with all Christian fiction, the point of these tales was to inspire faith, or to instruct the reader's conscience with themes of morality, or to embolden people to take on noble tasks. Well, Christian fiction doesn't do much for me. As you all know, I'm much more interested in Christian fiction. So why have I spent the first few minutes of my time this morning talking to you about this fiction account? Well, because of what it represents. You see, stories of this kind don't lay hold of the popular imagination unless they fill a need. Historical novels don't usually rewrite history. They usually fill in gaps where the history is silent or where the history appears to be silent. Now, last week, I dedicated the lion's share of my lesson to discussing the piercing of the side of Christ, the blood that flowed from his wounds thus inflicted, and the capture and application of that blood after it was spilled. For the sake of review, in John 19, 31 through 37, it says, Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. 
So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. According to the gospel accounts, concurrent with the death of Christ, his side was pierced, and from his side flowed water and blood. And this stands as evidence that he was, in fact, dead. But there's more to it than that. Christ is our Passover, and he was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, and his blood was spilt at the precise moment that the blood of the Passover lamb was being spilt in every household in Israel and by the priests in the temple. But, and this is vitally important for understanding the connection between the two, the power of the blood of the Passover lamb isn't in its spilling. The power of the blood of the lamb was in what was done with it after it was spilled. In Exodus 12, 21 through 23, Moses tells the children of Israel, when the time comes to slaughter the Passover lamb, capture some of its, capture some of its blood in a chalice. Then using a sprig of hyssop, dip into the blood and spread it on the lintel and the two doorposts of your house. From that point on, do not allow anyone to go out of the house till morning. For the Lord will pass through, striking down the Egyptians, and he will see the blood on the door frames of your houses, and he will pass over the door. The Lord will stand guard and will not allow the destroyer to bring you to any harm. The work of salvation accomplished by the blood of the Passover lamb was not consummated in its spilling, but in its capture. An application. And in the same way, the salvation accomplished by the blood of our Passover lamb, by the blood of Jesus, was not consummated in its spilling, but in its capture and application. But there's more yet, because Jesus isn't just our Passover lamb. He's also our sin offering, our trespass offering, our burnt offering, and the victim for sin of our atonement. So his blood was applied in a way that comprehends all of these sacrifices. Now, this is a theological necessity. The types and shadows of the sacrifices of the Old Covenant are types and shadows of the sacrifice of Christ. And in order for the typology of the sacrifices of the Old Covenant to portend the sacrifice of Christ and to be truly predictive, the blood that flowed from Jesus' wounds had to have been handled substantially the same way as was the blood that flowed from the wounds of the sacrifices of old. But this isn't just a theological necessity. This is also a theological fact. In Leviticus 6, 11 through 17, the Lord tells Moses that on the Day of Atonement, Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sins, sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. And he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the veil. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the mercy seat above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and with his fingers sprinkle, on, sprinkle it on the front of the mercy seat. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his fingers sometimes before the mercy seat. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take the blood 
behind the veil and do with it as he did the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of it. In this way he will make atonement for the holy of holies. Because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is also among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the Holy of Holies until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Now, that was a type and shadow of the sacrifice of Christ, the fulfillment of which is recorded in Hebrews 9, 6 through 12, where we read that under the old covenant, the priests of Aaron entered regularly into the outer room to carry out their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, uh, and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the Holy of Holies had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered did not have the power to functions of the worshiper. They are only a matter of meat offerings and libations and various ceremonial washings external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter bearing aloft the gift or the, or the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the Holy of Holies once for all, bearing aloft his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Beloved, it's a matter of biblical record that Christ was sacrificed in accordance with the four types of the Old Covenant, and that once spilt, his blood was dispatched in exact accordance with those same four types. But there's one piece missing out of that equation, and that's the biblical record of the capture of the blood that flowed from the wounds of Christ. And that's the vacuum that the legend of the Holy Grail seeks to fill. But the legend fails to fill the vacuum, and it fails utterly, because it is convoluted from the very beginning. It gets the facts wrong from the ground up. Because while there absolutely was a Passover cup from which Jesus drank in the upper room, which cup may very well still be in existence somewhere on earth, that cup, that grail, was never used to capture the blood of the crucified Christ. That isn't a matter of speculation, that's a matter of fact, because we know exactly what vessel was used to capture the blood that flowed from the open wounds of Jesus as he hung on the cross. And we know exactly where that Holy Grail is. And we know, to a high degree of probability, who it was who was holding that Grail in his hands at the time, and what he did with the Grail and the blood it contained after the blood was collected. And no legend is needed to fill in any gaps, because there are no gaps. This is not secret information. You may never have heard it before, but it isn't secret, and it never has been. It has been known by the church from the very beginning. Now, some of you may recall that I preached on this topic 12 years ago or so. And there are videos of my early sermons online still. And when I was putting those videos together, from the first time that I preached on the capture and application of the blood of Jesus, I discovered something that I had never noticed before. Because I was as I was gathering images for those videos, I looked at hundreds of paintings of the crucifixion. And in painting after painting, I took notice of something remarkable. 
something that I had seen before, but yet I hadn't seen it. Because in painting after painting, I saw that the blood that was flowing from the wounds of Jesus was being captured in vessels, in chalices, in grails. So I started looking for the oldest paintings I could find with this theme. And I found some that date back as far as the second century with the blood flowing into grails. Then I started looking for paintings from different traditions of the church because the legend of the Holy Grail, as we have received it, is a product of Western Europe and has survived largely as a French and Celtic tradition. So it's no surprise that we find such images and paintings from mainland Europe and the British Isles. But I was able to locate paintings depicting the blood of Jesus being captured in chalices, in grails, from northern Africa, from Coptic churches, from Ethiopic churches, Syrian Orthodox churches, Greek Orthodox churches, Nordic churches, Armenian churches, and Russian Orthodox churches. I even found images of paintings on the walls of churches as far southeast as the churches of Martoma in Kerala and Madras in southern India, which were established in the first century by the Apostle Thomas, and from as far northeast as the Nestorian Christian churches in mainland China, some of which were founded as early as 199 AD. And in every tradition of the church, in every culture that had been reached, dating as far back as the first and second centuries, there's artwork depicting the crucifixion of Christ with his blood flowing from his wounds and being captured in chalices, in grails. And I don't think that that can be a coincidence. No, what this indicates to me was that there was once a time very early on in church history when there were no Christians who believed anything other than that when Jesus was crucified, the blood that flowed from his wounds was captured in a vessel, in a bowl, in a, a flag, in a chalice, a grail of some kind. The only thing they seem to disagree about is who was holding the grail when the blood was captured. Some depictions have Mary Magdalene holding the grail, others Joseph of Arimathea, others some other figure. However, the most prevalent image by far depicts the blood flowing from the, the wounds of Jesus being captured by angels. Though two of the oldest paintings I found actually depict the blood being captured by Christ himself. Now, these paintings in and of themselves don't actually prove anything. But they do tend to confirm what I declared to you last week, that when the side of the Lord was pierced, his blood was captured in a vessel and carried by someone to the perfect and heavenly tabernacle. After all, following the crucifixion, the Lord stepped immediately into the office of our heavenly priest. And it was his duty as high priest to collect the blood of the sacrifice or to see to it that it was collected. In addition, every ancient painting I found that depicts Christ enthroned as high priest shows him either holding a grail or with a grail close at hand. And this is so across the board for paintings from every stream of the church from the British Isles to China. Again, testifying to a unified and early teaching of the church about a Holy Grail. This combined with the theological necessity for the blood of Christ to have been captured in a vessel and carried to the heavenly tabernacle, along with the knowledge that according to the book of Hebrews, Jesus did indeed enter into the heavenly tabernacle with a chalice of his own blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat there, confirms that the capture of the Lord's blood is a verified historical fact, 
we know for certain that that happened. What we don't know for certain is exactly who it was who was holding the grail when the blood was captured and who carried it to heaven. But I think we can be pretty certain that it wasn't Joseph of Arimathea or any other human being. And there are at least two reasons for ruling out human agency in the dispatching of the Lord's blood. First, there's no indication that any of the disciples of Christ understood the grand significance of what was happening in the crucifixion at the time that it was happening. This is made evident in the fact that they were all so puzzled when they first found the tomb empty. And this makes it seem completely unlikely that any of them would have had the wherewithal to take the initiative to collect the blood of what, as far as any of them knew, was a dying man, nothing more. Indeed, I think the mere suggestion of doing such a thing would not only have seemed pointless and absurd to the apostles, but it probably would have been anathema to them, because of all the things that the law of Moses forbade them to touch, lest they be made unclean, none had the contaminating potential or the degree of opprobrium as did the blood of a dead human being. No, I can't imagine any motivation that would persuade any of Jesus' disciples to collect his dying blood and carry it around in a cup for a while just in case they had need of it, with no idea what they might need it for. No, it's ludicrous on the face of it. Not only that, but the, but second and more importantly, we have direct biblical evidence that Christ would not have wanted any human being to be the courier of his blood. As you may recall, it was Mary to whom Jesus first appeared after he rose from the dead. And when she saw him, she became very excited and turned toward him, apparently as if to embrace him. But Jesus told her she could not touch him, at least not yet. John 20, 17, Jesus said, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, this has always presented something of a puzzle to me, because the ascension of Christ that was witnessed by the apostles didn't take place until another six weeks after this. And later that same day, when Jesus made his appearances to the apostles, he was more than happy for them to touch him, that they might verify that he was not a ghost, but a resurrected soul, a whole person, spirit, and body. So why did Jesus say what he said to Mary in John twenty seventeen? Well, it seems evident to me that on that morning, the work of Christ accomplished in the crucifixion was not yet finished. There was something remaining for him to do before the transaction of salvation wrought by his blood would be complete. And he told Mary what that something was. He had yet to ascend to the Father. And because he had yet to ascend to the Father, he didn't want Mary to touch him as though he were concerned that she would contaminate him in some way, or that maybe she would come to harm if she touched him. Then after that, he wasn't seen by anybody for several hours. And the next time that he was seen, he invited people to touch him. And he seems to have no concerns whatsoever that this will contaminate or hinder him in any way, or that touching him will bring harm to any of them. So what happened between the time that he appeared to Mary and the next time he appeared that evening? Well, I presume he did what he said he was going to do, that he ascended to the Father. And why did he do so? What business did he have in heaven that he, he had to take care of? Well, according to Hebrews 9, he would have had to have been completely pure 
to enter into the heavenly tabernacle, bearing aloft his own blood, to sacrifice it before the Father in the Holy of Holies. That's why he didn't want Mary to touch him. And for the same reason, it seems completely untenable that he would have entrusted his blood to any human courier for three days and three nights till he came back to retrieve it. No, if, if, if a hug from Mary would have disqualified him from serving as high priest, there's no way he would have entrusted his blood to any earthly courier. Whoever captured the blood of Christ must have been a heavenly courier. And that leaves us with only one question. Who was it? Well, if you were paying attention a year ago when I was preaching on giving, then you already know the answer to that question. Jesus is the high priest of the heavenly tabernacle, so it was his responsibility to capture the blood and take it into the tabernacle. But as I explained three weeks ago, Jesus wasn't available to take care of that task of the crucifixion or even shortly thereafter. No, when Jesus died, when he gave up the ghost, his spirit and his body were rent asunder, and he died. In death, in his spirit, he was carried by the angels to paradise, along with the criminal on the cross who was crucified beside him. But paradise isn't heaven. Paradise is a partition of Hades. Hades is a place where all the dead go when they die, but Hades isn't heaven. Hades is the waiting place where the dead go to await the judgment. And Hades, according to the Bible, is divided into three main sections. The realm of the grave, that is Sheol, the underworld of the dead, is in Hades. And all graves are in the domain of Hades. That is where the bodies of every human being who has ever lived and died has been buried in the grave, in the domain of Hades. And that's where the body of Christ went when he died. Jesus, in his body, lay in the tomb for three days and three nights. So in his body, he did not ascend into heaven. Now, in his spirit, he committed his spirit into the hands of the Father. And in his spirit, he went to the spiritual domain of Hades. And the spiritual domain of Hades, according to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, is subdivided into two sections. It's a place of fire and torment, where the spirit of the rich man went when he died. And there's the bosom of, the bosom of Abraham, where the spirit of Lazarus went when he died. And the Bible tells us, plain as day, that when Jesus committed his spirit into the hands of the Father, that he, in his spirit, along with the spirit of the criminal on the cross, went to paradise. But paradise isn't heaven. They're not the same thing. And we know that because even though Jesus, in his spirit, went to paradise when he died, he did not ascend to the Father. He did not ascend into heaven. That's what he told Mary in John 20, 17. I have not yet ascended to the Father. So we know, both by circumstantial evidence and by the testimony of Christ himself, that Jesus was not the courier who captured his blood in a vessel and delivered it to the heavenly tabernacle. So who was the courier? Jesus, the high priest of heaven, being dead, was incapacitated at the time. But as high priest, he had the authority to delegate that responsibility to one of his fellow priests of heaven. And as far as we know, Jesus has only one contemporary in his priesthood, the person for whom the priesthood of heaven is named. Now, we spent three or four weeks with Melchizedek about a year ago, and I told you quite a lot about him, but for the sake of this series of lessons, the lessons I'm preaching on Acts 5, I've got a few more things that I want to tell you about him. 
Now, remember, in Acts 5, 12 through 16, we find the following account. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. No outsiders dared join them, though they all held them in high esteem. And so many believers were being added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, that they resorted to carrying the sick out onto the streets and laying them on cots and mats, in the hope that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people assembled in multitudes gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And what I've been doing for the last three or four weeks is laying a biblical foundation for fully apprehending exactly what's going on in this passage and how it is that the shadow of Peter is healing people without any help from Peter. And believe it or not, I'm homing in on that. I'm homing in on one big, beautiful, interlacing knot that ties all of this together, one bouquet of thread. And next week, you're going to begin to see that grand tapestry being woven together. But what about the remaining loose thread for today's lesson? What about the Holy Grail? Is there a Holy Grail? Well, you bet there is. Where is it? Right where it belongs. In the heavenly tabernacle with all the other holy utensils. Was it ever in the possession of Joseph of Arimathea or Mary Magdalene or Percival or Lancelot or Galahad? No. So is the legend false? Well, the legend is a legend. But as with all legend, it's based on fact. And the fact is that there was a Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, the Lord did institute the Lord's Supper. And as part of that supper, the Lord did pour wine into a chalice, bless it, and drink from it. And that chalice will be instructive for us in our lesson next week. That's my lesson for today.